Well, hey there, everybody. I am back, and we still have work in progress on the big old T-34 heavy tank, um, which I took a little bit of a break from because it was just frustrating me. And you saw in a previous video where I compared the size of a Sherman M4A3E8 compared to that, and I have completed that Sherman, and I have done some a lot of work on it and um, a lot of detailing and I decided that what I was going to do was uh, take some time even though I didn't do a video on the whole build I apologize that this mat is not flat I need to replace it it has gotten a little bit warped uh, but what I was going to do was show you because I'm, I'm actually pretty proud of it the detailing on on this tank and uh, a little bit different talk how appropriate that we've got something that sounds like a World War II fighter taken off in the background. Um, talk a little bit about the detailing and and walk you through a little bit about how it was done and some of the techniques. Um, I say it's a different kind of video because rather than showing the production as it goes, I have the finished tank here in front of me. So, you know, we can look at the finished product and look at some of the details in it rather than uh, watch it be built. But I think that, you know, the star of the show here is this finished tank. And I'm, I'm actually, I, like I said, I'm, I'm really proud of it. Um, I did some different techniques here than I normally would do. I uh, took some, some chances. I, I don't want to say risks because, you know, what I did with it, I need to get one of those rotating bases too. What I did with this is, is things that other people have have done and perfected to great success, but things that I have not done before, um, you know, tried new techniques and um, experimented with some stuff that people, you know, don't normally do. And I hope that you'll agree that it has kind of worked to uh, pretty good success, making this a very war weary, very used. Um, maybe a little over dramatized, but you know, sometimes when we're doing modeling, we will make the subject a little more detailed, a little more weathered than than you know the real one was, just because we're trying to communicate a a, a picture or an idea or a whole feeling in such a small scale compared to what the real thing was. Um, on the other hand, if you think of a, you know, a tank at the end of a war, especially World War II, um, some of this weathering is not that unrealistic. We would normally see uh, weathering this heavy on you know, an older German or Russian tank, but um, some of the American machines that survived you know, got very much this beat up too. So anyway, what we're looking at like I said, is the M4A3 E8, also known as the EZ8. Um, Sherman served, uh, you know, on on different fronts, um, in different models. Um, the E8 specifically, this was one of the. Um, how should we say? Um, this was one of the the biggest, baddest Shermans there was. It had a high velocity, 76 millimeter uh, armor killing gun. It it made a switch from previous versions. Um, now, not this, but I mean, it, it used what, what was a switch um, to the horizontal volute, volute uh, uh, spring suspension. So the HVSS from the vertical system that early Shermans used. Um, which really was an improvement, gave it better cross-country mobility. Um, it, you know, it was just a great um, improvement on the original Sherman design. Had a little, um, had a smoke mortar built into it, so it could lay down a little bit of a smoke screen in there, which was kind of relatively new at the time for a tank. Um, had improved engine performance. Um, Improved track. I mean, there are so many different tracks that Sherman's used throughout the war, uh, but it, you know, it, it just it it did a lot of really, really important fighting throughout the war, 
and where you know you saw a lot of these late model Shermans fighting was in the march into Europe, um, into Germany, towards late war. And this one specifically is um, an, an example of the 6th Armored Division, post-Battle of the Bulge, took part in the Battle of the Bulge, after the Battle of the Bulge, crossing the Rhine, you know, um, into Germany, um, the heart of Germany, uh, racing towards Berlin, trying to beat the Russians there, fighting along the way, uh, whatever opposition they found. Um, this is, um, I just really like the markings on this one. Now, I have fudged the weathering on this, because this particular tank, a paper doll, did not look this beat up at the end of the war. Um, but I really wanted to show the harsh wear and tear that a full campaign in Europe could 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 bring on um, a tank, and I you know I wanted to you know one of the challenges of modeling just an OD green vehicle, a a single color vehicle, is that what are you going to do with it? Now there's modulation you can do, which is different colors, different shades of of, of green and yellow greens and everything on top of each other, but. I think personally, and I'm going to probably offend some people, I think that that is, again, my experience is in modern armor, okay? I, I obviously didn't serve in World War II, but it, it it looks more cartoony, it looks more anime. Um, if, you, if you were around actual armored vehicles, yeah, sometimes the, the paint gets a little sun bleached on the tops and everything, but it, it's not... <sighs> You don't see the serious gradations of color that a lot of modelers use. While it does look fantastic on a model, um, it it doesn't you know it doesn't it doesn't. I don't know how to how to say this, and I'm not saying that it's not beautiful effects, and I'm not saying a lot of them don't look very realistic when they're done. I personally don't like the technique, so I wanted to try something else. And I normally you know I I I shy away from modeling single color, especially green vehicles. Because I know that it is challenging to get a very realistic looking effect out of it. Um, and, and you know, the you know modulation is one of the ways to go. Um, whether it is, you know, color modulation through, through various shades or uh, pin dot modulation where you take um, different colors. Like, for example, you could take very small dots of, say, a, a pale yellow color, you know, in a orangish color, a white color, um, oil paints, and then take a, a soft brush with like white spirits and, and blend it like a filter. Sorry, that's a pin dot filter. That's not modulation, but, um, you know, or, or something like that. Basically, it, it, you know, something to change so it is not one single flat slab of color. But in reality, coming out of the factory, these tanks were one flat slab of color for the most part um and it is through the battlefield and and through the use that the color was was tinted not changed but tinted by what was thrown on it um and that's what i tried to imitate that's what i tried to replicate on this tank i took um basically the whole thing um starts with so let's talk about the model itself actually before we do that so this is the uh, Tamiya um, M4A3E8 Sherman, uh, Easy 8 European Theater Kit, built the model straight out of the box um, with a couple add-ons, but like the model kit itself didn't didn't do anything to it. So it comes like built just just as just as the pieces are in the box. Started with the you know normally. I, I cheat. <laughs> I do the turret first because the, the turret's the exciting part with the gun and everything. But first thing I did was all these these bogey assemblies. Um, I did the wheels separately. Um, I did the assemblies with the suspensions. Um, then I built up the lower hull section. I painted everything. Now, you know, the way it is, you can't even see. Um, I used, actually, uh, Akan's um, old rubber, dark, old rubber dark gray for the the rubber on the wheels a lot of modelers will instead of putting a metallic color on the exposed um 
metal for the, the suspension pieces and the springs, they'll just paint it OD green. And, and that's cool because a lot of times they just sprayed that OD green. You know, in the factory during assembly, they were they were actual, you know, metal. You know, through the course of use, um, if they did paint it, it would come off. If you go see these things in a museum, what they do to refurbish them a lot is just go nuts with a spray gun so you don't often see bare metal. I, I made the artistic choice to, to give you the bare metal there. So it breaks up the all green, looks good, and then you could weather up. Um, but in the field, if you do some research, you'll find pictures where through use, uh, that that green paint that if it's put on does come off and on the springs it does flake off so you know I wanted to model that so I did the entire lower hull section first and you can't see any of of what I did in there unfortunately and that's too bad but you know that's it is what it is um, what we've got in there is um, AK interactive streaking grime and rust streaks um, as almost uh, a filter um, and brushed and blended underneath it all um, and you've got weathering on it's it's really it's it's hard to tell I'm going to get outdoor pictures later and I'll probably do a little slideshow at the end of this because pictures in, in, in the photo backdrop in outdoor light are the best um, but you've got weathered up with uh, some dry brushing and some more, you know, rust and streaks and everything on both sides. Um, so I did the entire uh, lower assemblies first, got them on there. Um, I even, I don't know if you can see here at all, I, I cut some chunks out of the rubber, you know, because that happens with, with tanks, especially older rubber um, that will rot a little bit faster than like newer, better chemically um you know chemical compound rubbers so uh, and i even dry brushed the rubber and everything and you can't see any of it under the mud so okay it is what it is did all that you know first uh then i built the turret so i can have a good time with the turret um, did the commander's cupola separate because it has actually clear vision ports that i didn't want to and we get a little shine on them maybe i didn't want to install well, can't even get it to focus so so there, uh, I didn't want to install that uh, cupola until after there, you see a little shine on the vision ports there, until after I got those installed. So that all, uh, this was done separate. Uh, Commander was one of the last features I did. Uh, then I did the whole upper hull area. The, the whole thing, like I said, straight out of the box, these spare tracks went on um, one of the last steps once it all went on uh, primed and painted in one step with Vallejo um, OD green surface primer which is great because you know the tank is OD green and it's a great base uh, it's a great primer it is the same color as we're using for this guy right here um, like showed it in the video right there gave it about 24 hours gave it a uh, gauzy agent glossy over coat um, went to work on the decals did decals in my normal method with the one two punch of microsol and solvacet now these decals are i had never used them before these are uh, star decals sourced from ebay very nice decals but uh no silvering nothing like that however even on a glossy surface, they have a very matte finish to them. And when we're dealing with things uh, like um, this uh, 23 is a single piece decal. So you've got clear areas under all that. And I was worried because, uh, or the paper doll, um, clear areas, or this data plate right there, um, clear areas underneath that were very matte on top of the glossy surface. I was worried um, that we'd have some weird looks when it was done, but you know, after another coat of gauzy on top, you can see we've got a single surface on there. So it, it picked up that gloss really, really nicely. Um, what I had done while I was building was I carved out some kind of damaged chunks 
scrapes and things of that nature. So you can see here on the fender, I'm sorry, I don't know why autofocus is being a giant jerk. Uh, on the fender, uh, I don't know if you can see the carved out texture, but you know, I have several areas along the tank where if you were to feel it, you'd feel that it's actually um, kind of jagged cuts out of the metal on the turret, on the mantlet. Um, I think I even have some on the, the glacis over there, uh, you know, just all around places where the tank might encounter some damage along its travels. Well, I filled those damaged areas in with, with different metallics, mostly gunmetal from uh, AK Interactive and some Vallejo and some uh, steel colors, you know, and then that way when I washed them, they'd have, they'd have some different looks to them. The tracks were all initially painted in Vallejo gunmetal gray. And um, once that was done, I thinned down the uh, AK Interactive um, rusty track wash. I think it's just called track wash uh, with some more odorless thinner. I put it on um, like very light because I didn't want, you know, I wanted to build the layers up. I, I ended up building up a very rusty track layer, but it's kind of hard to see under all that. And then gave a dry brush of steel on top before I started caking on the mud. Now, a lot of the mud is actually just various brown paints mixed with some baby powder, but I also used uh, some, uh, I think it's a, no, it's Vallejo Mud Effects European Mud. And then um, Vallejo uh, Mud mixed with uh, grass. So you get that nice texture look to it all. And that kind of rounds off. And then of course I splattered it, you know, on the lower parts of the of the deck and on the running gear and all that. So it's all over the place. Now, once we had all that done, it was time to really start weathering up the turret. So I started when, you know, decals all settled down, another nice coat of, coat of gloss to lock it all in and give us an acrylic base so we could start working with some more uh, weathering and everything, knowing that I was gonna turn to enamels. Dry brush some areas with uh, steel and gun metal. I also took just a very thin brush and, and gave an, an edge, kind of almost like an edge highlight to some areas with it, uh, especially focusing around doors where the crew would walk, um, you know, raised edges, places that would probably get the effects of, of lots of chipping metal, 90 degree angles, places that would come in contact with lots of, you know, rocks and, and stuff like that. Selectively, I chose some areas that were going to get a rusty wash right on top of the metal. And I also chose some areas that were not, um, you know, kind of dry brushed with metal, but then I used, I believe it was Panzer Aces uh, Rust Brown. And then I did, I used a very thin brush, uh, was this one specifically. And what I did was I just painted on some chipping effects um, and some rusty areas. And those are the kind of the dark brown areas you see. And I also used some um, sponge weathering on there. Some of those I left completely alone. Now, my favorite rust effects, and you can see kind of on the barrel there and on top of the turret and everything, I used the, um, the AK uh, rust streaks and I, uh, what I, 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 I want to say watered it down. I enameled it down. I thinned it down with a little odorless thinner and I, I put it on top of that. Uh, I filled about 80% of the center of that brown with the thinned down rust um, streak like liquid. And that gives you that almost kind of kind of a 3D rough, where's like some of the best examples of it, you know, gives you that, that 3D almost like, you know, rough kind of crusty looking rust effect. Um, that I love. You see how it almost looks like like real chips, because it looks like it looks layered. It doesn't just look like, um, you know, one layer of of brown paint on there. 
it looks like actual different layers of rust you've got the brown you know chipping dark rust and then a very simple way to improve it is to put that thin down rust streak fluid on top and then of course you can you know use your standard um you know rust streak coming off of it to go down around the rest of the tank but it gives it a great great effect so once i did that i chose some rusty areas and then I did uh, a combination of... Now, I didn't use the, the dark um, streaking grime for green vehicles. I used the regular streaking grime because I didn't want to... I didn't, I didn't want to have lots of dark streaks. I just wanted to make it look... Uh, I don't know what the word is I would use. Uh, I didn't want it to be overpowered by the streaks. So we've got streaking grime on there. We've got the rust streaks but not in an overpowering way. I should say, by the way, uh, for a filter, before I did any of the streaks, uh, I, I, I decided to experiment with something new. I used um, Anthonian Camo Shade by Games Workshop as a single color uh, filter, um, just to, to kind of mute down the OD green to give it a different kind of finish, a little bit of a greener, uh, warmer green finish uh, I think it worked great as a filter color now you can buy some really expensive green filter sets on the market um, I just decided to give it a shot and it worked great it worked really 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 well uh, and I put it you know right over the decals and everything it's it's a light you know when you if you if you spread it around and you actually take the time with like a large soft brush oh man I use Got a whole set of these, $2.99 at Walmart. Nice soft brush to really spread it around evenly. It works great as a filter. I thought I might, as I'm going through here too, also um, show you guys all the different things, like actually I've been talking about it, but show you the different um, paints and, and different things I used, uh, you know, that I talked about. So here's the surface primer of Vallejo USA Olive Drab. Put that in the background right there. Um, on top of that, for you know, for a lot of my metal effects, uh, I said AK Interactive. I meant Ammo of Mig, Gunmetal. Need a new one, and Steel. That just the uh, I kind of labeled them myself, and even I use them so much that the names have worn off. But I know exactly what they are. Great metal colors for doing all sorts of stuff. Um, where is my? Also, I love Vallejo. Gunmetal Gray is a great color for that. The Games Workshop, the Citadel, uh, Anthonian Camo Shade that I used for the filter color, just for brushing along the entire vehicle there. Uh, for the decals, Microsol is my one. Solvacet is my two. So there's my one-two punch that I use. I, I, I have great results with decals of every brand, every type on every surface using those. Gauzy Intermediate works great as a gloss coat for, for most projects, and it's an acrylic, so you can do all sorts of oil, enamel, and uh, you know weathering techniques on top of that. Okay. Here's the Panzer Aces, uh, also by Vallejo. Dark Rust is the name that I used for my rusty chips, and then, of course, backed up with um now I talked about this with the tracks but uh rust streaks and track wash track wash is is also a very rusty color okay so but rust streaks um thin down with odorless thinner any enamel odorless thinner or even the testers smelly thinner will work just fine for that so you can use that too um, then we talked about using Streaking grime. Um, now this says again for dark yellow vehicles, but it has a very subtle effect. You can see it at play when you do it on a green vehicle or a dark vehicle. If you're going to do like darker greens or like the NATO three tone, uh, three color camouflage type thing, you're going to want to use, you know, uh, the dark streaking grime. On the tracks, besides just various browns, mixed baby powder. There's the um, European mud which is a 
pretty nice little mix there. Um, I also sometimes will mix my paint with, with breadcrumbs actually for more of a kind of a rocky look to it. And then there is mud and grass, which has little pieces of flocking in it to give it the grassy look. So I'll keep, I'll keep adding stuff as I talk about it as we go. <clears throat> so once all that kind of basic stuff was down there, uh, and I say basic, but you know, you'll notice I didn't spare the decals. I put it right over the decals because so these markings would be painted on. Comes from the factory, painted green, goes to the unit, the markings go on. So I just, you know, I weathered right over them. For realism, uh, what most of these kits don't come with, if you can see, is these these drainage holes. So you got your your oversplash guards um, by the fuel caps, but they're on the real thing. There are drainage holes. Um, there are plugs that go in them, but a lot of the crews just took the plugs out because who cares? Um, so uh, I took a um, 0 0.04 uh, around these two and a 0 0.05 for the ones around the turret ring. Uh, drill bit and drilled those holes. Now for fuel splashes and everything, which is very realistic out in the field, and you can see we've got some fuel effects and then we've got fuel dripping down from those drainage holes you know as these things were re hastily refueled out in the field and i covered it up a little bit with some of the stowage there um, but we've got lots of spilled fuel and stuff coming down so for that ammo of mig um fresh engine oil is awesome i mean it literally looks like oil um, and you can use this as, as an oily kind of thing you can again you can thin it down um, to make the kind of older more evaporated sort of drips and drops um, you can slosh it right on and like so around the fuel cans there you'll see it has more of a sorry about the auto folks again see it's got more of a a thicker darker um, wetter effect that's using it straight out of there i mean you can do a lot of things with this so use that for weathering as well around there to, to give it that kind of refueled hastily in the field look. Uh, it didn't come with a tow cable. So I made a tow cable out of uh, the inside of some parachute cord, 550 cord. I actually, I, this was not planned, but I have it. So I used one of the inner strands, which is great because it's a braided cord, looks just like it. Now the kit came with the, the end pieces, but it didn't come with the uh, cable. So I just measured one out um, from front to back, um, painted it up in steel, gave it a, a thinned down rusty wash, laid it across the vehicle the way that a tow cable would be, and bam, you've got a tow cable. Worked out pretty well. Then I moved on to some pigments. Now, where it looks kind of like rusty wa rustness over here, that wasn't intentional actually. That was not supposed to be rust. I was trying to do some thick dirt pigment weathering in there um, i screwed that one up it ended up looking just like rust so what we've got there is a combination of mostly um, burnt umber and a little bit of yellow ochre um, pigments uh, in there and some standard ak interactive pigment fixer uh, you know any pigment fixer works with these in fact, Vallejo Airbrush Thinner works as a pigment fixer as well, if you don't have that. Um, there, and if you don't know how to use this stuff, just YouTube it. There's a million tutorials. So I was trying to make dirt. I recognize it looks a lot like rust, heavy, heavy rust in there. That was not my intention. But I think it works either way. But that, that's an area where, over time, dirt is going to build up there as, as stuff is stacked up there. The crews use this as storage. They throw all sorts of stuff against there and, and dirt would definitely build up on there. I also use a lot of pigments um, on the road wheels. Before I even did the mud effects, um, I, I put pigments in there. Now you can't even tell really because um, now it's all kicked in mud. What you're seeing here, the lighter shades, that's pastel weathering after the fact. So the uh the pigments are are in there looking kind of like mud okay well it is what it is some standard uh always use this some citadel gnome oil uh to darken up areas you know um 
around seams, uh, around natural lines, you know, around here, just to bring out shadows and recesses and, and you know, around rivets and uh, the transmission cover, these bolts that hold it on, things like that. Uh, used it liberally on the uh, engine intake, uh, the engine covers, you know, with these intake grates, just to define the, the, um, the detail there. Uh, once I painted the tools, so the tools were fun to do as well. Uh, I used, um, what did I use for the tools? I used, uh, started with Vallejo Desert Yellow of all colors for the tool handles, for the wood. Okay, and then from there, I did a combination of um, washes in Seraphim Sepia, which is kind of a brown wash, and Reichlin Flesh Shade, which is kind of a reddish wash, to give that reddish brown wood look on the tools, you know, in just in different amounts throughout to make the wood look a little bit different. So these, these got involved as well. And I would use them again, by the way, uh, as well as the Anthonian Camo Shade on the stowage on the back to uh, add different shades and colors uh, to make things look a little different. Now, I'm not going to pull out every single uh, green and brown I used, but uh, the Desert Yellow, since I didn't have a dedicated khaki, worked really well for a khaki color. And, and again, I used different um, different washes from Citadel for different things. Um, these were a kind of light green originally, um, different different greens, light greens, olive, gra olive drabs, dark greens, all of these uh, bed rolls and, and stowage pieces and everything. And, you know, combinations of different washes to give them different looks um, with different dry brushes on top of them to uh, bring out different shades and tones in them. So all different finishes, you know, are, are accomplishable by using the same tools over and over in different ways. Um, everything holding on all this stowage here, this is thread. This is, and I have it here, thread. <laughs> That's all. Once again, with, I believe I used the Seraphim Sepia Wash to give it a, a dark rope look to it. It's uh, literally tied to various points because you can see, you know, these braces. So I tied it on, uh, crazy glued it to places underneath the stowage where I couldn't actually tie it, but to make it realistic to where it's actually holding these pieces down as it would, as the crew would, would tie things on. Um, I left this piece unwashed, you know, as if they had maybe a different piece of rope um, holding these jerry cans on. Uh, we've got one water and three fuel cans. And if you notice, painted in various shades of green so that all the cans didn't come out of the same batch. And once again, different different wash types on different cans. And I'm sorry, the light is glaring, so you can't really see the different fuel splashes. But I'm sure you'll see them on the pictures on the slideshow at the end. The extra track links were painted with the track segments, and they were just put on later on. Um, with then an extra gnome oil wash um, to, you know, just darken them up and and make them look ready and kind of dirty on, on the side of the tank. Um, I, so pastels. Pastels are great weathering tools. A piece of 120 grit sandpaper and a little box of artist pastels makes very realistic looking dirt and grime on your tank or anything really. And so... Where I like to do is I like to take a uh, small, but uh, I'm gonna say a soft, but a firm brush. So yeah, you guys figure that out. A soft, but firm brush. This guy right here. And you grind your pastel you want on the sandpaper, and then you can kind of load it onto the brush. And then you just sort of, now there's two ways to do this. You can brush this and leave it directly on. As you brush it in, it will get into the finish on the on on the paint and everything you can then cover it up with your your overcoat uh, whether it's gloss dull or whatever or you can put it directly on your overcoat it looks super realistic if you put it on your overcoat because literally it is a dirty dirty um you know layer on top however 
you risk fingerprints and things like that. Now, if you're careful and you gently rub it in, it's not going to come off. Um, I like to do a little bit of both. So you see I mixed, I don't even know the names of the colors, I mixed uh, this very dark guy and this uh, not so dark guy right here. And I just basically put dirt where the crew would be walking around a lot. In this area here, around the hatches, on the engine deck, uh, I swept some along the side of the hull, uh, up on the fenders, on the, the glacius plate over there, you know, um, on top of the stowage, which also, by the way, got a little bit of a, like I said, a dry brush of uh, a light color, you know, a light tan. I can't remember what it was, just to bring in the details. So I also put it up on the turret um, behind the 50 cal, you know, where men would be standing um, up around the front of the turret, like maybe where the commander would mount and dismount and everything, on top of these vision ports and kicked into the little areas uh, around them because you might not see the actual detail right away, but it, it all adds to the realism there. Um, these vision ports, by the way, also got a very thin wash of the seraphim sepia, um, so it settled around the edges, as did the commanders, if you can even see. Uh, his goggles, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. The pastels are, are really, really good for adding, you know, a nice little step. So that, that worked out really, really well. Like I said, I did, I did some of this on top of the final coat, our matte dull coat, because it's a tank that's going to have that. So I tried something new uh, on the recommendation of a, another video I watched. And I, for the life of me, I cannot remember. I wish I could give credit to the YouTuber that I saw using this. I can't remember who it was, but this is the matte coating I used. Um, I, I first I tried uh, just brushing it on something straight from there. It doesn't work matte. It's it's like a semi gloss if you just brush it on. However, you put this in your airbrush, and you know because the the video I saw he said if you you know he mixes it with a little bit of future for like a semi gloss because um, he said if you put this on straight it is it is dead flat matte. And so I when I brushed it on I was like liar. Um, but you put it in your airbrush. I used. Um, uh, testers uh, acrylic thinner and um, probably oh, about a 60-40 mix 60% um, this uh, matte varnish to 40% thinner I mean and this you see the result it's pretty damn good uh, it came out great so nice dull matte finish for the, the remainder of the weathering to use. The last kind of one of the last steps to do was the commander. And basically I treated him like I would treat a Warhammer figure. Um, I did some standard Warhammer colors. So instead of khaki, I used Zandri dust with an Agrax Earthshade uh, wash on top. I used uh, US Forest Green for his helmet just to set it apart from everything else. Basic skin tone, Vallejo, basic skin tone with uh, Reichland Flesh Shade for the skin. Now, I again, I don't think you're gonna be able, I can't get I can't get this in front of the camera the way I want to because the gun is gonna be in the way. I wonder if I can zoom in and actually have it show you autofocus on him. There we go. Um, did some dark brown for the helmet liner. Uh, custom mix of brown for his gloves. Mm. There you can see the uh, that's just basically uh, silver with an overcoat of the seraphim, seraphim uh, sepia and uh, gauzy gloss over it for the the gunner's sight. You can see those vision ports clear, but still kind of like you know dirty and cloudy in the turret in the cupola rather. Sorry. I do have to add an antenna, but that's always my very last step. I'm going to use a very thin metal wire. I just haven't done it yet because I didn't want it to break. Uh, the kit actually comes with these really nice clear goggles for you to put on the helmet. So I used um, some PVA glue. You could even use Elmer's white glue 
once I so I I, I outlined it in black. Um, PVA glued it to his helmet, so it's like totally clear. You see the helmet. Took a piece of very thin masking tape, painted it black, and then wrapped it around his helmet for the band. Um, and then you've got well, those eyeballs are a little beady eyed there, but it needs, you know. He's looking. He's looking a little bit off to the side. Very uh, nice machine gun on here, lacking some detail, but uh, 50 cal uh, with some rust effects on it too. It's, it's going to be very hard to see in in this small area, but 50 cal's all done, ready to go. So um, I'm I'm really happy with this tank. Uh, and then, of course, we need some some weathering on the muzzle, which I I could have used the uh, the pastels, uh, just a black pastel, which normally I would do because it, it comes out very well. But I used a Tamiya weathering palette this time because I had it around and I, I haven't used it yet. So I used the soot. And whoa, okay, that's cool. You just take a little foam brush, and I'll do a touch up here right now because I've been touching it. Just take this little foam brush, and all you do is you just rub it in, and it's basically it works the same as pastels. I mean, it, it really does. And you want to make sure the darkest part is right at the end of the muzzle, where you know round comes out, and then the muzzle break area. You put some in, and then you want to blend it backwards. Um, you don't want to just have it abruptly stop. But did it there, did it on the uh, exhaust deflector, um, and a little bit on the on the muzzles for the machine guns. And that kind of completes the illusion. I don't think I don't think there's anything else that I that I missed. I think I accidentally called this periscope the. The gunner's actual sight, so the gunner has his little sight there next to the gun, and he has a periscope. It's not two different things. I'm really happy with the way that with this tank came out. Now, this is actually the first Sherman I've ever built. Um, so, I want to stress again. Now, I built I built some uh, World War II stuff in the past, uh, lightly weathered. Like this is the first heavy OD green vehicle weathering I've done. I'm very happy with the way it came out. I, I usually try to keep my weathering on vehicles light um, because I know that crews take, re from experience, I know crews take really good care of their vehicles because your track is basically your life out in the field. It's where you, it's your home, it's your office, uh, it is your weapon, it is sometimes your kitchen. Um, you'd be amazed at how quick you can heat up an MRE uh, on the engine deck or inside an engine panel. It is, I mean, it is your everything when you're out in the field. So, uh, you know, crews take remarkably good care of their vehicles. Even in combat, they take remarkably good care of their vehicles. And if they don't, the first sergeant has something to say about it. Um, God forbid Sergeant Major sees a, a track that is not in good repair. Oh my gosh. So, um, now of course, World War II was a much different war than the one I've been, I've been part of. So, you know, damage, rust, uh, degradation. Uh, I just wanted to make something, you know, that I could really use weathering effects in. So I'd love to hear some opinions on this tank. I'm actually uh, not keeping this one. I like to keep my projects. I'm selling this one. Um, unfortunately, I'm sad to see it go because, man, put a lot of work into this one, but uh, it is what it is. But I think weathering is probably the most fun part because that's where I think really your, your work comes to life. That's where a model... A model looks like a model it looks like a plastic model until you get to the weathering phase and then it really comes to life and starts to look like something more than just some plastic parts out of a box you know so i would i would i you know i welcome comments uh criticisms and corrections on on how i made the sherman look 
since this is this is the first one I've done at recognizing that it is overly weathered. But uh, any comments you guys have on any of the techniques I use, if you want to share some of the things that you might do, you know, please feel free. I just I really enjoy weathering. It's it's it is the way to put real life into your projects. If this was informative or somehow educational or you know helpful to anybody out else, I you know that makes me super thrilled and I'm glad that I could contribute to someone else's project. That's awesome. Thanks for joining me. We'll get back to the big old T34 uh, next time. So I'll see you again with that big old monster real soon. Mm -hmm.